Psalm number 84, Longing for the Temple Worship, verses 1 to 4. How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts! My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for the joy of the living God. The bird also has found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. How blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. We continue our sermon sessions in the Gospel of Luke, and we find ourselves this hour in chapter 6, verses 20 through 26. Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 26 will be the portion of Scripture proclaimed. At this station of inspired writ, we find the witnessed and recorded account of our master teaching, of course, what is commonly quoted as the Beatitudes. The attitude we should have, the behavior we should practice, how we should be, the Beatitudes. And in Luke's mind, as a physician, the detail, of course, remains the same in the doctrine, yet, of course, from a more so expedient manner. And you certainly are encouraged to read the Beatitudes also in Matthew chapter 5, along with Luke chapter 6. And therein you can begin to rightly handle and interpret what it is our dear Master and King is revealing. And friends, in a world that has fallen quite deep in all sorts of lawlessness, and with it comes much hate, much hate and division, chaos, riot, pain and sorrow. The cure always remains within Christ and the instructions he has delivered to all of us to receive and to practice. We are created in His image. He loves us dearly. And He gave this information so that you and I could learn from it so that the world, our community, and those around us can change, can change his or her direction to have integrity, to have decency, to be morally upright, to be kind and compassionate, forgiving, loving one another, loving our neighbors. It is indeed information that would have us productive in His kingdom. That's why it is governed in an inspired tongue to have us change the way we think so that it changes the way we live in order to become productive citizens of his kingdom. These are not, um, how should we say, they are not mere opinion in which we can choose to neglect and reject they reveal the commanded instructions giving us purpose and behavioral practice to be upright as citizens of his kingdom. So, of course, we begin in verse 20, Christ turning his gaze towards his disciples, his focus on his disciples, seeking to have his disciples pay attention. Though a crowd listening his disciples to pay attention. This information is important for Christians 
to be faithful in his church, to be productive in his church, to be different than the world, to be called out away from the world and the way they do things so that we can now practice the way of the Messiah. And he says, as his gaze is towards his disciples, he begins in verse 20, he says, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed, most joyful recipient of His grace. Blessed, most joyful recipient of His grace. Are who? Well, those of us who are poor. Does He speak of economic poverty? Perhaps, when one is found in poverty, he or she is, uh, how should we say, uh, reverently bowed, begging alms. Please help the poor. The individual is in a submissive and humble posture and motive of the heart to receive the crumbs that may fall from our table. You see the thought, the position of one's mind and heart. Please, please, I need to eat. Please help me. And we, of course, are wise to see that situation and help the individual with food when the opportunity arises. The idea, of course, that Christ is teaching for those who are productive in his kingdom is having that same submissive, humble heart, reverently bowed, bowed, bow, bowed before him always. We are constantly in hunger for his teaching, his word, to be faithfully working in his kingdom among his body of believers his family, his church. Most joyful recipient of God's grace are we when we find ourselves begging God more food, food, nourishment, please, Lord. For in that position of desperation, we will indeed receive his nourishment. And to that blessing, the kingdom of God, his church. In Matthew 6.33, it would say, Seek ye first the kingdom, and all these things shall be provided for you. In the context, of course, if we are humble, seeking souls, open to receive the doctrine of our Lord and Master, we shall be provided for food, shelter, and clothing. How, as a poor person, can that be the case? Because if you find yourself as a poor person in Christ, among us here, you will have food, shelter, and clothing. None of us who has the ability to practice the blessing of benevolence will allow you to go without food, shelter, and clothing. You see, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that not a beautiful hope for all of us and for those out there in the community who might find themselves in the same reverent bowing? Christ, of course, spoke of his kingdom that he would be crowned king in Matthew chapter 16, verses 16, 17, and 18, speaking, of course, synonymously in description of his church that he would build, his kingdom. His kingdom is his church, his body of believers. This here will belong to you if your heart is humble. A true and genuine, authentic, poor person. 
As our brother JV spoke, he has seen poverty. My wife and I have traveled to other countries and we've seen deep poverty. I assure you there is poverty in this nation as well. Sadly, more so than not at the hands of delinquency. They just don't want to work or they have an ancestral delinquency in their family. But at times you may find in, a, in, in, in the nooks and crannies of rural areas people who are very poor. But we've seen it in, 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 in its more raw form in other countries. They don't complain about what you give them for food. You're not going to give them a morsel of, of nourishment, a, a piece of nourishment, and they're not going to be like, ah, I don't like that sauce. I don't like that. Um, you won't find that among poverty. They, they'll eat what you give them, and they'll be extremely thankful for it. When we had visited a location of great poverty, I was just given gifts. I was giving dollars. I was given things. I, I think I gave a hat. Or, or, and to them, it was just the, the, the most beautiful thing they could have ever had. Over here in the West, we throw things like that away all the time. But to them, it was such a, wow. They kept following me a lot around the, the rest of the resort just to, to serve me. What can we do for you? Please, you know, employ me. You're so kind to us, you know. The idea, of course, is, is the same with Christ. Um, we're not going to pick and choose his nourishment. Uh, well, I, I'll take that from you, Lord, but I won't take that from you, Lord. No, listen, all of it. And we are desperate, aren't we? When we are in poverty, we find ourselves desperately seeking nourishment. So it's not, um, how should we say, eh, apathetic, idle, vain, bored. It's deep, desperate survival. If I don't have food, I die. In deep poverty, interestingly enough, Folks don't really have the time to ponder on their emotions or any murmurings or complaints. They work. If they don't work, they die. They can't eat. They must eat. They're desperate. We don't have time to sit back and ponder on everything this life throws at us. We have to find work. We have to eat. It's really that simple. But some... They fall sick, don't they? They fall sick or they find they, they may be lame or crippled in these locations. Well, they can't work. And they have no family to feed them. So they are desperately bowed in reverence, begging. And what they receive, if it even be uh, a bowl of rice, is thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You can see it in their faces, in their eyes. Their children are just... <laughs> we, had, we had ministered to a lady once, and I've shared this account a few times, but it was truly eye-opening or humbling uh, when she had come here from uh, uh, another country, and she was with her children, and she was in poverty, and we had uh, prepared a meal for them. And uh, you could see this, this child, I suppose, what? three, four years old, maybe approximately, very young, four or five, four or five years old. And, uh, you know, us Westerners, we're accustomed to having so much food, we throw half of it out in the garbage. We have so much of it. We're spoiled rotten, and there's a judgment for that, by the way. We best be wise. Anyways, so we're, we got, we, we had chicken and potatoes and a, a nice meal, and of course, the, the child upon seeing the buffet, the, the, the feast before her, uh, it, it, it was just, you could see the eyes. Just like, and he, <laughs> she was just looking at her, her, her mother. He, he and her, I think, right? Looking at the mother. <laughs> it's like, wow. Like if you had given them, you know, for you and I, a ticket for, I don't know, a million dollars to go somewhere. I don't know, something that we would be like, wow. To them, chicken and potatoes, wow! 
And he had such a cute little voice. And he was speaking in French. They were speaking in French. Des patates, mama. Des patates. <laughs> it is just such a beautiful thing. And by, by the time my kids were uh, finishing up their first, you know, chicken uh, drumstick, I mean, they were on their fourth. <laughs> we're like, there's enough. Eat. Is it okay? Yeah, eat. Uh, if we could tap into that, if we could tap into that in regards to spiritual affairs, this would be the chicken and the potatoes. And we're the little five-year-old kid, the four-year-old kid looking at mom saying, the word of God, the word of God. Ah. <laughs> you don't eat it that way. You eat it here. Well, we, I mean, we understand a bit of the humor there with the illustration, but the point is most blessed, most joyful recipients of God's grace if we find ourselves with that kind of spirit, that kind of motivation, that kind of heart, I need, I need God. I need God. There's no other way to survive. I need God. Please, God, please. God says when you're like that, well, yours is the kingdom of God. And that's something. Yours is the kingdom of God. He continues. He's teaching us, of course, how our hearts should be. Because the religious leaders of the day, as per uh, uh, their delinquencies and hypocrisies, they, they portrayed themselves a certain way outwardly. But inwardly, they were the complete opposition to this heart Christ is revealing us to have. They were not reverently bowed before God, begging, begging mercy and, and love and compassion and nourishment. They were like this, puffed up and looking down on these sorts, looking down on them. Ah. It's often at times, you know, you travel into the inner city here, you will see individuals begging. You will see all kinds of decay, if you will, societal decay. Um, and what is sad is when you recognize the accounts of poverty in the New Testament, uh, the ones in which Christ would interact with uh, was stemming from a true context of, of, of uh, desperation. They were truly poor. They had no family. They had no way to provide for themselves. They were crippled or lame. And they needed the love and compassion of their fellow neighbors. And the religious leaders would look the other way, would shun them. Or if they did give to them, it was a show. It was like, hey guys, look at me. Look what I'm doing. I love them. It was, it was not, it was, it was just a portrayal of an image that they were creating that was not truly what was within their hearts. Sadly, in today's society, because of lawlessness, and it has all sorts of different political names to it, um, my wife and I, quite often when we go for our errands throughout the week, we'll, we'll, we'll come across these individuals. And sometimes we will choose a candidate to stop and, and uh, perhaps help. Uh, we had an individual for, for a long time we'd stop and help because he's always at the same stop sign. An elderly uh, fellow, an elderly fellow who uh, we um, interpreted as a genuine individual in need of help. And we would help and we grew rapport with him and he got to know our names and we got to know his name and we got to exchange numbers and we kept inviting him, of course, to come to studies and things of that kind. But here's the thing. Sadly, nowadays, it seems 95% of them are not truly the, the desperate, bowed, seeking nourishment kind of a poverty. They are just products of delinquency and uh, laziness drugs and alcohol and stuff like that. Uh, so we are indeed called by God to have discernment with those things. And sometimes those things come through trial and error. But understand that the kind of motive and heart that is being spoken of here by the Christ is true. It's authentic. It's real. It's not fraudulent. It's not trying to take advantage of you. It's not 
portraying itself as as something it is not. It is it's really just this childlike innocence that needs food. And if you could help, please, you know, well, that's how we ought to be with God. And he continues in verse 21, Blessed, most joyful recipient of God's grace are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Okay? Again, it all, it, it, it began the same way because it's the foundation of one's heart. It has to be humble. It has to be reverent and bowed. It has, to, it has to desperately seek Christ always. If that is the case, then the wonderful family, unity and provisions and security and hopes and goals and forgiveness, all spiritual blessings are given to you. The kingdom of God, the church of Christ. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. You will no longer need to have hunger, but you are not to take what will be satisfied as granted. You remain thankful to God. If you hunger, you will be fed, not only physically, but friends, the idea spiritually fed. If the teachings of the scriptures are no longer appetizing for you, then you are no longer filled and satisfied with the Word of God, but you are now sadly filled with self. Do we understand that? Blessed, it continue, he continues, Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. He turns our hunger into the joy of nourishment. He takes our sorrow and our tears and He gives us joy and laughter. Blessed, verse 22, are you when men hate you. You see here the Christ he speaks first and foremost the practical elements of one's behavior which would make he or she faithful in his kingdom and productive in his kingdom, capable of receiving the blessings. But there is indeed a cost and sacrifice to our service in his kingdom. Blessed, most joyful recipients of His grace are you when men hate you. And ostracize you. And insult you. And scorn your name as evil. For the sake of the Son of Man. How are we to be the joyful recipients of His grace if men hate, ostracize, insult, and scorn us? Well, you see, it's for the sake of the Son of Man. If you are a humble, submissive, reverent, bowed individual in Christ, organically, by the fallen ways of of this world, you will be persecuted. You do not need to go out there and seek persecution. It's going to come to you spiritually when you are faithful. It just is. We've been called every name in the book. We've had our lives threatened by those closest to us, by those we've never met, because we stand for the truth and we love each other and we uh, 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 follow the Christ according to the description of the Scripture. And the case is an objective absolute. We will be hated, ostracized, insulted, and scorned for the sake of His name, for the Christ, our King. 
Don't go looking for it purposely with a heavy hand. Be faithful, we together, exposing evil, proclaiming the word of God, bringing people to repentance. And it is inevitable that we will become the recipients of persecution. We are hated. We are hated and ostracized, insulted and scorned as evil. Because the world calls what is evil good and what is good evil. And as strange as it may sound for the way we naturally reason as human beings, when we go through these moments of persecution, and the purpose we are going through this persecution is because we stand for the truth of Christ. Because I assure you, a great many out there are not standing for Christ, though they think they are, and they are receiving persecution and thinking it is for the Christ, but they are not. It is for self that they are receiving their pain. But when genuinely for Christ, it teaches us a great many things. James would write how joyful we ought to be when persevering through various trials and temptations and tests and pains and sorrows, whether spilt milk inconveniences or true and deep pain of loss of loved ones, natural disaster, disease, persecution, persecution from our own who have compromised themselves away from the grace of God, persecution, malicious words given to us by hostile, corrupt, governing powers, by all sorts of deviated religious traditions and, and, and worldviews and practices, we are hated by the world. John would specifically say, if we seek to be friends with the world, we become enemies of God. We're not friends with the world. We're friendly to our neighbors who may be lost in the world, but we're not friendly with the world. Define the world, sin. We're not friendly or in fellowship with sin. We do not encourage, promote, associate ourselves with murderers, with rapists, with sexual deviants, with liars and gossips, with unrighteous, violent individuals, with all sorts of criminal activity. Do we love their souls? Yes. Are we friendly with them and kind, showing them the love of Christ? Yes. But are we in fellowship? Are we together? Are we united in the same yoke? No. And because of that, our sheer existence on this earth as faithful Christians is hostility to them. They can't stand us. You walk into a location where individuals are openly practicing sinful things. And as a Christian, you sit down there among them. You don't think they're going to get uncomfortable? You know they will. You've seen it in their faces if you've been in the church long enough. If they are living in sin, your, your existence around them is making them feel guilty. They don't want you around. In our past life, you were not permitted to enter into my courts, our harem, if you were not a sinner. If you came in high and mighty living a life that was not practicing our lawless desires, then you were not, you don't belong here. We don't want you here. We Christians are the recipients of persecution. Our existence, the world hates. You don't even need to say anything. Just being around people and they know you're a Christian, a faithful Christian. Well, here it says, do not become bitter, right? Do not become bitter 
bittered or, or, or practice vindictive retaliation or revenge or anything like that. What does it say? It says most blessed are you. Why? Because in such we connect with our Lord and Master and what He has gone through, number one. Number two, it is indeed evidence that we are doing what's right when what's wrong hates us. You see, that's why the Lord's church, His people, will always be in the minority. We will always be a small group. Even if we are blessed to have, let's say, 400 souls in this community that convert and become with us faithful Christians, we're still the minority. We always will be. Most will not convert to Christ because of these here verses. Because your mother and your father are going to hate you. Because your grandmother and your grandfather are going to hate you. Because your sons and daughters are going to hate you. Because your neighbors are going to hate you. They will. They have. And some of us have understood that with great pain. So most are tempted to read this and say, I just can't do that. I can't. And it's sad. But the truth is as it speaks. Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn you. That is in every shape, form, and format. You may lose your employment. You may lose your em employment. You may have false witness bore against you. You may have all sorts of malicious words spoken against you, slander against you, lies against you. We are to have a peaceful heart and understand how blessed we are for being able to receive persecution because we love Jesus. The apostles would leap for joy when they had been persecuted, imprisoned, beaten. And friends, that's not a... Uh, we must understand the context. It's not simply a... Oh, yay, I'm getting beaten and put in jail. You know, this, this very misguided thought of thinking we are somehow virtuous by, uh, by default of, of receiving. The, no. It, what kind of a heart did he begin speaking in verse 20? A very reverent, bowed heart, humble heart. It's the same humble heart that must continue throughout all the other attitudes he reveals. We must have a kind and joyful heart, glad within ourselves that we were blessed to be able to be persecuted for our master. Isn't that a strange concept? The beauty of his kingdom, we together, is we don't have to share in that joy alone. We can speak of it together collectively because it happens and we share those moments. Yesterday, an individual he called me this, that, and the other. And it's not, it doesn't like feel good being called names and being persecuted, especially by those you love and those who are near to you who refuse to follow the Christ. But there is a sense of joy in your heart that you are doing what is right. When you are publicly out there proclaiming the word, teaching the truth, you become the target for all sorts of persecution, I assure you. But there is a way to train our thoughts to be glad, as it so speaks from the Christ in verse 23. Be glad in the day, in that day, and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. You see that? Okay, now let, let's just take this as it, as, as it moves forward in the context. We are to be humble recipients of God's nourishment. And if we do so, we will receive and be satisfied. We will no longer find ourselves weeping, but yet laughing in joy. And that same spirit and element must be active when, it's a matter of when, if you are never being persecuted, let me throw this out there. If you are never being persecuted, ye chances are you're not faithful. It just is what it is. 
that that's a big red flag that you should become very aware of. Now, that doesn't mean go looking for it and start screaming with a, an open microphone at everyone to, 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 to become the recipient of harsh persecution and be like, ha-ha, now I'm faithful. No, no, don't, don't get it wrong here. If you are a faithful child of Christ, you will be persecuted. If you've never been persecuted, chances are you're not a faithful child of Christ. It just is what it is. That doesn't mean you need to go looking for it. It just will come to you in one shape or another. Be glad in that day and leap for joy. Why are these things to be taken with joy? Your reward in heaven is great. If you're seeking the practical mind mind uh, uh, exercise, when those things happen, think, justice is coming for those who are wicked and peace is coming for those faithful and humble in Christ. One day, within an hour no man knows, the sky will open, the trumpets will sound, and we will have eternal peace with our Master in heaven. And what is awaiting us in heaven far exceeds anything that this life can offer. And if we tap into that, well, we won't be afraid to die for the cause. Great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. It's nothing new. This is not a new invention for our era. Every single faithful follower of God, from the beginning to the end, will have gone through the same persecution from one measurement to another. And that comforts us because we're not alone. We're not the only ones. Other Christians out there like you and I have gone through what we're going through. And you and I can speak of these things. We go through these things together. But woe, now we go into the woe. And I like how from verse 20 to verse 26, if you look at verse 20, 21 and 22, first three verses there of this portion, Jesus explains and describes and commands the kind of heart we ought to have to be productive in his kingdom. As a productive citizen of his kingdom, he then goes into verse 23 and 20, uh, well, 23 to explain, uh, sorry, verse 22, I'm mixing up here. Let me start all over. Look at the pattern. Verse 20 and 21 gives us the element and instruction and command on how our heart is supposed to be. Verse 22 and 23 explain to us what will happen when we have that kind of a heart, that kind of a faith. We will be persecuted. Now in verse 24, 25, and 26, we have, of course, the woe. The woe. But woe, verse 24, to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. This is not an inherent rebuke against anyone who is faithful and has accumulated wealth for the greater good of the kingdom. There are many wealthy Christians recorded in the scriptures. This, again, is dealing with the motive of the heart. And those who were rich, the Pharisees were greedy. And those who were rich, of course, would look down upon the poor, would look down upon those who were weeping, and would be part of the problem persecuting the faithful. So woe to them. For on this earth with their riches and their corrupt heart, they may be living a very lavish life with everything that is available to them with physical comforts. But it's empty and it has an expiration date and judgment is coming. Verse 25, Woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. 
Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. You see how he goes in the reversal of the blessed ones. If you are not among the blessed ones, the receivers of his kingdom, the receivers of his nourishment and joy, his, uh, uh, then you are found in the corrupt location of this fallen world with the greedy and with those who have a full belly of evil works. Woe to you, verse 26, when all men speak well of you. For their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. False teachers, wolves in sheep's clothing, diatrophies, they are always going to have their loyalist and their praise teams, their brotherhood cliques. And they may have all they want in this life, on the, in this world, but there is an expiration date coming for them. It makes me think of the account of the rich man and Lazarus and how the roles were so, so different once they departed this earth. On this earth, the rich man had all things and did not care to practice benevolence with his brother at the gate. But yet when they both departed, one was with uh, God and the other was in torment. We are to be humble hearts seeking the nourishment of God, being productive in His kingdom. We will become the recipients of persecution, but have comfort. Those who persecute us, those who choose to follow the false and the error, they will be judged by God and his justice. And that brings us comfort to know there is justice. In this life, in this world, justice at times is not always available. It's not always practiced. But I assure you, as the scriptures reveal, on the day of judgment, justice will come to all of us who have been robbed of justice. So we can certainly be joyful and leap when we are persecuted. For we are humble and reverent before God, seeking his teaching his instruction, and what is evil will be punished. Paul himself, the apostle, spoke to brethren in the first century, Thessalonica, who were being persecuted by their own kind, by hostile governments and by all sorts of false religious worldviews and teachers. From all angles, they were being persecuted. And Paul told them, the day of judgment is coming, and God will eternally set these souls in consequence. And you should be encouraged with that and comforted with that. Again, not with vindictive bitterness, not with retaliation or revenge, but with the joy of justice. The joy of justice. And therein we conclude this portion of Scripture and the wonderful power of the Christ and his authority to teach these behavioral attributes we should learn to grow into. If it were not for the Christ, we would not have this instruction. We would certainly be most miserable and lost. But with the power of the Christ, we can raise again with him into newness of life, Romans 6, 3 and 4. We don't have to depart this earth along with those who are the recipients of the woes. We can be called out of that location where the woe is found. You don't want to be with the woe. You want to be with the blessed. Okay, so how do we go from the woe to the blessed? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Master, the Son of God? Yes. Are you willing to change your mind to stop practicing sinful things, to stop believing sinful ways? Are you be willing to start this new journey? Yes. Well, then you qualify to be immersed, calling on His name, born again, out of water and the Spirit. And when you come up out of that water by the power of His resurrection, 1 Peter 3.21, calling on His name, Acts 22.16, then friends, guess what? You're no longer among the woe. 
you're now among the blessed. That transaction, of course, is made quite clear by the penmanship of the Holy Spirit in Ephesians chapter 2, from darkness to light. That is available to all who truly have a humble heart, have a hunger for more knowledge, and seek to heal and find joy in Christ. Okay, that'll be it. We can move forward now with a song.